Hello, everyone. Dr. Darshan Shah here, and this is the Next Health Forefront podcast. And I have an awesome person on, on the line here today. I, I just can't wait to introduce you all to him. You probably all already know who he is. If you don't, you will after this, and you need to get to know him better. He is my friend. He's a comedian. He's a health nut. He has his own podcast, the Michael Yo podcast, and he's an incredible father and husband. Everything I know about you is just is just Aww. awesome. I'm so glad to have met you and become your friend. And uh, Michael Yo, ladies and gentlemen, he's on our podcast today. Welcome. Thank, thank you so much. I'm excited to talk and kind of, you know, get the word out about this COVID-19 and how serious it can get. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't known, you know, who don't uh, know yet, Michael actually went through COVID and not just, not just, you know, he had it and then he felt fine and then he went, went, he went about his merry way. He actually ended up in the hospital and um, I invited him to join the podcast today because I think people don't really know a lot of others that have ended up in the hospital and have spent a long time in the hospital. I think it's still, especially in California and Los Angeles, it's still pretty rare actually. And to hear a firsthand account from someone as honest and as, and as uh, you know, easy to talk to as you, Michael, is going to be, I think, very useful for our listeners. So I appreciate you doing this. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, I still think about it and it was so surreal. It was so scary, surreal. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. And, and I want to talk about some of your emotions around this because, you know, this whole thing really snuck up on you. I remember you and I had coffee before you went to New York City uh -huh. and you told me you're going to New York this weekend, you're doing a show. And, you know, this is when we were hearing a few things about Corona. Like it wasn't like a massive, it was, what date was that? It was May 6th. So at that time, when I went to New York, 11 people have died and they had less than 4,000 cases in the yeah. US and New York, I mean, you can't even call it a hot spot at that time, but there was noise about New York. I was in and out. I did four shows, canceled all meet and greets. So I didn't meet anyone. And I flew back home and even the, even the comics I were with 24 seven, they came back on the same flights as every, and everything. And maybe they're asymptomatic, but they never had anything. You know, right. so it, it's, it's kind of weird how it came down so hard. So I came home, you know, I was fine. And then uh, a couple of days later, you know, it hit me hard. I, I put myself in isolation for three days because it was very odd. Like I felt it was a bad fever, which is at that time, bad fever was like 100, 100 .5, 100 .5 to like 102. So right. I, I dealt with that at home, but I was like, oh, this has got to go down. Took some Tylenol, went down. So I kind of did that for three days. And then the fourth day, man, I had no breath. Like literally, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, oh. you know, my wife found me, called 911, ambulance picked me up. As soon as they got here, they gave me oxygen. Uh, and they literally said, oh, you, you have it. I mean, they didn't have a test, but they go, out of everybody we've seen, because remember, I, I live, I don't live in Los Angeles. I live on the Burbank side. So, well, Studio City, but I live on the other side of the hill. So I think as far as like research, I think the number over the hill in the valley is so low compared to, yeah. you know, the other side. So when I got to the hospital, I was the first person at that hospital with Corona virus. Wow. So you know, the first thing they do is you get there and they go, oh, you got Corona. Uh, they push me in the room. <clears throat> they take a chest x-ray of you first to right. see how bad your lungs are. And they go, hey, um, you know, I, it wasn't the doctor, but it was maybe a nurse goes, hey, so you have pneumonia and Corona at the same time. And then in my head, I'm going, oh, my God, that's the thing that's killing people. It's not Corona by itself. It's when it's when it causes pneumonia, then you got both things attacking your lungs. And my lungs were filling up with fluid. And then the doctor came in and I go, hey, uh, you know, as I'm trying to get air, am I gonna be okay? <laughs> and he goes, he goes, you know what? Uh, it's gonna go good or it's gonna go really bad and we'll know in two days. And you can't wow. see family. Wow. And, and that's when it all hit is like, oh my, 
I'm going through the worst pain I've ever felt. My head, it's almost like if somebody was hitting me with a hammer at the same time with, on both sides, it was the worst migraine I've ever had in my life. My body was aching. Um, I, it, it was like my body was just shutting down. And um, that's when I started thinking about my family. You know, like I have two days and if I only have two days possibly, it will be the worst two days of my life because I'm feeling horrible and I'm not going to be able to see my family. So yeah. that's when they took me to ICU and they put me in so there. So you went straight from the ER to the ICU? Yes. You, you went from the, wow. Yeah. This is really serious by the time you got to the hospital. Yeah. And I don't think people like my friends, cause I made it. I don't, I tell them I was in ICU, but I don't really think they know how sick. Literally I was in ER and the next stop was ICU. Right. You right. know, and it, it was like, it was serious. And they put me on, God, I don't know how to say it, but the malaria drug. Right. Uh, uh, right when I got there uh, for a day and a half. And they started me on the HIV pill the same day mm. I first got there. And it was funny, everything I saw on TV. Yeah. <laughs> literally, they were giving it to me 30 minutes later. I was like, oh. <laughs> so I was like a guinea pig, but in a great way, because right. all the doctors, since I was the first one, wanted to try to figure it out, you know, what's going right. on with it. And I was right. the perfect candidate. I don't drink, I don't do drugs. So I'm, you know, I'm healthy. I work out six times a week. I'm 45, you know, I, I so I'm like perfect for it, you know? Yeah. So after a day and a half, the doctor told me they took me off of the malaria drug because where my body was at that time, it was not a good fit. I don't know what that right. means, but that's what he said. Mm. You know? Yeah, I think, you know, you were like one of those people, like we talked about this a couple of times, is that people, I mean, there's definitely people who are um, going to get going to get this disease worse than others. But there's two groups of people. And one is the people that are predisposed to it, which means that they already sick for some reason. They've had lung issues or they smoke or they're older or they're diabetic. One of those things that makes you predisposed from basically any virus because your immune system isn't great. But you, you're like one of the healthiest people I know. And that's what we're always talking about is how to get your health better and better and better. Yeah, I want to, yeah. Yeah, right. You fell into that category of people that had this over robust immune response. It's kind of, it's, we call it cytokine storm and medical jargon. But it's basically your immune response went out of control and started pulling all this fluid into your lungs and, and causing you to feel like you're almost like drowning, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. I felt like wow. I couldn't catch my breath, you know, wow. and I just took an x-ray on the sixth and uh, they said, I still have fluid, fluid in my lungs. But he said, before I even got out, you know, he said, you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, it's gonna take six to eight weeks for our, the fluid to get out or maybe even longer. Yeah. So yeah. you don't have full lung capacity. So still at times, I'm not short of breath because I don't, you know, I, I've learned to, I'm winded. You know, it's different right. than short of breath. I'm not trying to get air in. It's almost like right. when I'm talking, I just run out of air when I'm talking. So I get winded right. and right. that's still a happening. But, and why is that happening? It's because your lung hasn't fully recovered from having what's called a consolidation inside of it. So what, what happens is your lung is basically a bunch of air sacs. It's like a big sponge. And it's when you take a deep breath in, all the little holes filled with air, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened with you is that that immune reaction and the virus caused that sponge to get soaked in fluid. Now, most of the fluid is gone, but you still have probably at the bases of your lung, that fluid is still there, causing it to, um, causing those air sacs to not be able to fill with air. And so you, you only have this much air instead of having, you know, 25% okay. more than that. And that's where, you know, that's when we decide to let people out of the ICU. That's when we decide to let you go home is, are you taking enough air in to oxygenate yourself? Can you keep your pulse ox, you know, high enough? Can you have 98% or more um, oxygen in your blood? And, and you can still, you know, your lungs are incredible. They, they have a higher capacity. If you're healthy, you don't smoke. So you can have 98% or more oxygen saturation with still having some fluid in your lung and that's what's happening but you're going to get winded because your lung is not at its, at its best so you're used to mentally and physically having your full lung and now you yeah. might have 75 80 percent of it mm -hmm. so that that's what's happening and it's going to take a while like your doctor said it's going to take you a while i'm curious though like 
when you're in the, how long were you in the emergency room for? Was it like an hour, four hours? No, it was literally, cause I was so bad. Like yeah. I was really bad when I got there. Mm -hmm. Like in um, probably like 30 minutes from wow. when I, they dropped me off to being in a room in the ICU. Was that like the scariest moment of your life? Yes. It was yeah. the scariest moment because in the way it was, and I'm not, it's just because I asked the doctor to be honest, you know, I'm, I want to know the real deal. I don't need sugar code. So the scary part was like, Oh, two days. And then they didn't tell me I was going to be okay till four days in, yeah. you know, but I started feeling better. And when I say better, just not like feeling like I was going to die. Like the not pain got so bad. And I hate to say this, the pain got so bad where if they had an eject button on life, I might have hit it. Like that's wow. how bad it, I've not it was I can't even describe to you wow. the pain I was in. So there was something definitely going on and you know, I think, you know, I was texting with my wife a lot and you know, I knew I couldn't see her. You know, and then you think about your kids, you know, I got a 3-year-old and a 4-month-old yeah. and I was like yeah. this is the worst way to go, you know, right. but then after, you know, those 2 days I mean, it yeah. was every two hours they were injecting something in me. You know, like I said, I, yeah. I think it was like in a good way, a guinea pig, because I was the first person. So, you know, I had allergic reaction to a couple things they gave me, you know, so mm -hmm. we were all learning at the same time. And one thing that the doctor told me, because, you know, you hear a lot about ventilators. And from the first day, he goes, because that came up. You know, and I go, he goes, I'm going to do everything I can to keep you off a ventilator because right. once you go on that, it's done. And I go, why? He goes, because once your body stops breathing for itself and relies on another piece of equipment, that is dangerous, very dangerous. So it's so interesting. What I learned is so interesting that, and this was luck. I've never been to this place before, but your life really depends on a doctor's decision. You know, like if he put me on a villain, I might have not made it because now we're finding out in a lot of cases, that's the wrong thing to do. You know, you give them oxygen and put them on their front. Especially, I think the natural reaction, like what I'm hearing, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a professional expert, but from what I'm hearing, a person can't breathe, they're gas fair, give them a ventilator. You know what I mean? And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to do everything but that. And just that decision could have saved my life. So that's what's yeah. crazy about you never it's know crazy. the luck of the draw who you're going to get. So I, you know, I've taken care of hundreds of people in the ICU, took care of hundreds of people on ventilators in my time. And I can tell you it's different for different situations. Okay. So if you had gotten stabbed in the chest, then yeah. we put you on a ventilator right away because we just need you to, you know, fill up your lungs with oxygen so we can get you to surgery, fix the hole, and then you're fine. We take you right off of it. But it's true when people have infections that are overwhelming of their chest, um, putting someone on a ventilator sometimes can be the kiss of death. And mainly because once you get put on a ventilator too, it kind of is a signal of things going in the wrong direction because what people don't understand, and I've had this conversation with a lot of people that ask me like, hey, can I buy a ventilator to have at home just in case? I'm like, that's gonna do no good whatsoever because it's not just your lung failing, your entire body shutting down your kidney, your liver, your brain, everything is going haywire when you're put on a ventilator and you need that ICU team around you. You need someone smart making decisions and coordinating all the different specialties, the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, the nephrologist, all these different, I'm sure you saw a lot of these specialties, oh, yeah. you didn't even know it. And um, you're right, the goal is to keep you off the ventilator, but and, and what I've been hearing a lot from my buddies in the ICU that are, are taking care of people is once people get on a ventilator, it's almost a 50-50 chance that they're going to make it off the ventilator, but they're also on a ventilator for weeks and weeks. Like you're but, not just on for a day or two. But are they on a ventilator because nothing else is working? And is, is yeah. the last resort or are they putting them on too soon? No, I, I, they're using it as a last resort. I think, I think, you know, I think most doctors know when you only use the ventilator as a last resort in, in these type of situations. But I think, you know, it's so nuanced and there's so many different numbers that we look at 
that doctors make that decision at different points in time, right? Mm. And everyone's, right now, you know, it's pretty amazing. I see doctors all coordinating on message boards and, um, and I see doctors around the country are trying to figure out what's the best way to deal with this. And a lot of it has to do also with your particular state of health. So you, we can keep you off ventilator longer because you're super healthy, but mm -hmm. other people, they need to get on sooner as well, like if you're a smoker or something. So it's, it's definitely nuanced, but I was going to ask you about that. Like, were you in the ICU the entire time? Just, you, you know, I mean, it must have been hard on you because you don't know minute to minute if you're going to get put on a ventilator because then you're, I'm sure they told you, you're putting kind of well, like a coma. Yeah, well, I believe that after the sec, like three and a half days, I felt better because I could breathe and my oxygen levels went up. So I felt mm -hmm. good, but the first two days I had no idea. Yeah. But I know the doctor, every time he came in, it was, I mean, he was pretty sure, like, my, my temperature got up to 103.5. And then they would bring it down, and it, it would go back up. His thing was breaking this with a fever, you know, right. going through hell to break it before they put me on a ventilator. Like, literally, yeah. I feel like I went through so much punishment, body punishment, to yeah. break the fever and to break everything. Like, my body got so hot where it was like, we need to, we need to stop this naturally. And we'll bring your fever. We have no problem. We can take your fever down, but you're going to ride that one, 102 to 103. But if it goes over 103, we're going to bring it down. Like you're going to ride that to, to get, I mean, it was, it like, that was his you know decision. Why? why? Yeah. Because you, the fever is an indicator of your inflammatory response. So what they're trying to do is get your fever down because they need to get your, your inflammation, your immune system response under control. Yeah. And so that's what they're, use, that's what they're trying to do. Because once again, I think you're one of those people that it was your immune system having this out of control reaction, this cytokine storm causing you to get sick. You see what I mean? So that, that's a really important point. And so I think a lot of people, you know, I think, I think for the listeners out there, um, it's important to understand that this, this is a really challenging virus because it's not just your typical, you know, I have the flu real bad and I got really sick and ended up in the hospital. This immune response that people are making is really causing a lot of the, the really bad cases. And that's what you went through. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Is that like an emotional roller coaster those first two days where you just like... I'm so, I mean, it was... I was honest with my parents, you know, what could happen, but I wasn't honest with my wife because I wanted to give her as much hope as possible. Wow. And I, and she's with my two kids. That's the last thing. I mean, she knew it was serious. Trust me, yeah. when 911 comes to your house to pick yeah. you up and you can't breathe, it's serious. So I was just trying to give her hope and inspiration, but my parents knew the real deal. And it yeah. was, uh, it was definitely scary. And you know, when I, I knew I was out of the weeds about four to five days in, you right. know, once I broke my fever, I think it was the, the fifth day, cause they, the maybe five and a half days I broke my fever. And that's when I knew, but here's what's crazy. Just in that five days, so many more cases came in the mm -hmm. Corona case, yeah. like it filled up in just those five days. It was kind of crazy. And then like the big thing I want to tell everybody, like, People are dying alone in the hospital. So when people are being so selfish by not taking the right precautions going out, to all these people being so selfless, like, like I mean, people are putting their lives on the line for us. At least we can respect that. And, you know, people are dying alone because this corona thing's going around and a lot of people are not doing their best to control their end of it. And that's what's so frustrating right. about it. It is. It is so frustrating. And it's, it's hard to see all these protests going on and people saying, well, you know, 10,000 people dying is nothing compared to 100,000 people losing their jobs. And, you know, it's just, it's just a lot of selfishness out there. And we gotta, we gotta look at the big picture. People are dying. I mean, this is, this well, is not. Well, here's the whole thing about that argument. Okay. You go open your business. Nobody's coming to it. You know what I mean? That's what's so like open. It's just a, it's just a thing to put out hate out there. And it's a thing to get the message off where instead of saving lives, it, it becomes, it's us against you. And it's just ridiculous. Cause my thing is like, okay, open your business, open your business. Guess what? 
nobody's going. The only people who are going to your business is the people in this rally, you know, and they're probably not even coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a thing where it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, people love to get fired up about stuff. And then mm. when it comes right down to it, they end up not doing anything. Can I tell you what's <laughs> crazy about today? People what? hate facts. Yeah. Like a lot of people, and I don't want to say people, everybody, some people really hate facts unless it benefits them. Mm -hmm. Like, and that goes right. for science too. Like some people, now, now people believe in science. Some people believe in science, but don't believe it at other times. Like you don't get to pick and choose, you know, it's, and, and why are we fighting facts so much? I've never, you know, I've, I'm, look, only been alive 45 years, but I've never been seen a situation where people just hate facts, like right. real, real facts. <laughs> and they will dispute real facts. That's what blows my mind. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, you heard that the whole thing about how this whole thing is a Bill Gates conspiracy. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, exactly. It's like people want to turn a fact into a political reason for them to oppose the fact. Yeah. Just for the sake of bringing you politics can't, into it. You can't say something that's factual anymore without somebody putting it to politics, to one side right. or the other. You know what right. I mean? Like, and that's the problem with politics today is you can't say, I agree with this person. Like, say I'm a Democrat, look, and I agree with a Republican on something. Oh, you're not really a Democrat. No, they have a good point. Or vice versa. A Republican can't agree with a Democrat. You know, and that's the problem. So that means they're not working together because they're trying to outdo each other or hate on each other. So they're not working together. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's just, but look, this all starts from the top. We all know it all starts yeah. from the top. It all starts from the leader. If the leader's like that, then everybody follows. There you yeah. go. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how this whole thing turned into a political fiasco between governors versus the federal government and et cetera, et cetera. Like, why? Like, do you, like you said, the facts are the facts. These are the things that we have to do. And I feel right? horrible for Fauci and I, what's the lady's name? Um, In Michigan? Burke? Burke? Yep. yep. Uh, yeah. Dr. Burke? Or maybe yes. that's what, okay. Like, the pressure on them to walk the line so they don't offend Donald Trump, but give us the real facts, you know, that, that's, I can't imagine that pressure. You know, I, I can't can, imagine. I, see, yeah. I can't imagine yeah. Donald Trump saying something as the president and Dr. Fauci going, "All right, well, you know, he has to walk that line. That pressure must be so extreme, so extreme." You can see him about ready to blow up. Like he he wants to say something and he just holds it back. He can't. Because he knows. He can't. <laughs> he can't say he what can't he do to it. Say. He can't do it. Right. He can't do it. All right. So, so did you just buy a new 5G phone before all this happened? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And that's another crazy rumor. 5G is right. starting this. It's like, okay, this thing is in pretty much every country. And pretty much every country doesn't have 5G. So that has nothing to do. It's just the, like all these rumors. It's so stupid. I mean, I can tell you from being a doctor, from being a scientist, I've really read everything about this. There's a hundred percent no way that 5G causes that Bill Gates had anything to do with it, <laughs> and that someone invented it in a lab. I mean, all those things are ridiculous. People need to throw out those misconceptions because until they accept that this is the normal way viruses come around every hundred years or so, you know, <clears> if we don't take that seriously, the next time this comes around, it's probably going to happen a lot sooner because there are a lot more humans on this earth now. We're not going to be prepared again. It's going to cause another economic well, global disaster. Well, I can't see us not being prepared. After this, you know, because here's, here's, look, I survived and I'm happy I survived. But I do think in tragedy, hopefully we'll grow from this and they'll be prepared next time. And I think they will because now we know this can really F up America. You know what I mean? and the economy Absolutely. and who's ever president is not going to want that ever to happen again on their watch so i i 
it's like it's the same thing after 9 11 things change you know but they change for the better you know so i think i mean look at all the like look we could we could communicate through computers. You don't have to go to doctor's yeah. offices. You could do right. so many things different that we're learning that what the bad part is, corporate is noticing this too. And they're probably going, oh, why do we need these big office buildings? Right. You know, we can eliminate <laughs> those. People just work at home. Uh, or, hey, we're not functioning that bad with less people. So more people are going to lose their job because we know how the corporate world is. I've worked for some corporations where once they had to lay off a bunch of people and things kept moving, they go, oh, well, we can lay off more and give people three jobs. And the bad thing about this is I think you're going to see that in the future. I yeah. think you're going no. to see corporations cut down and go, instead of working with 100, now we can work with 70. Oh, 70 working? well, let's cut a few more and give them that job. So now you're down to 40, you know, so I can see that happening after this. And they're working at home. So we don't have to have an office for them, a cubicle. We're making more money because we don't have to pay for this building, but then paying them the same. And we're cutting down the staff. I mean, this is going to lead to some great things and some really bad things. Yeah. Look, I mean, if you look at history back in 1914, when the first, you know, when the first global, pandemic that we have a lot of great historical records of things change permanently and yeah. i think this is the same way after every world war things change permanently this this is basically a war the whole world is fighting this war right now and like you know the amount we spend on defense every year we're trillions of dollars right and how much is how much the did a war really cost us in terms of lives and economy much less than what this yeah. cost the country mm -hmm. So you can imagine, I mean, we need to spend trillions of dollars being prepared for the next viral outbreak. And I, so, and I, do, and I do think they're going to they're gonna have to make those, take those measurements. You know, yeah. uh, it's just something that after you go through it, it's going to change. Like I know, and I told my wife, I travel a lot. Once stand-up comes back probably next year, I'll be traveling right back at it. But now... Shoot, I'm from South Korea. I'm putting a mask on everywhere. You know, like there's no reason not to have a right. mask on when you travel. Like, but I'm educated more now, you know, especially after going through this. Man, I feel like, like, I, it's crazy because we're stuck inside the house, but I wake up every day happy I'm alive, but also so grateful that I have another shot at life. I want to live it. So I can't wait to live it because I, I'm so inspired. Like I, I'm doing things that, you know, I always said, I'm a, I'm a get to it whenever, but now I'm doing it. Even like, I've always wanted to be more flexible and very simple things, but I never took the time to stretch. Now in yeah. quarantine, after I got back from the, I'm stretching all the time and I'm so much more flexible, That's amazing. you know, That's so I'm amazing. doing little things that I, I thought that I would, nah, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And I'm just happy to be here today. So I'm doing everything yeah. I can. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. That was going to be one of my last questions for you. Like you had a near-death experience, right? Yeah. And how does that change you? Like you're, you're, you're doing more things that you never did before, but how does it change your just outlook on life and your relationships at home? Tell me a little bit about that. I think uh, it's a thing where mentally it changes you. And it changes you more than a car wreck. You know, because when you're in a car wreck, you go, oh my God, I, my life could have been taken. You know, but with this, car wreck happens so fast. Mm -hmm. This, it's kind of like, you got two days to think about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you said, yeah. and actually longer than that, because even when you come home and you don't feel 100%, you're like, am I going to wake up tomorrow? I, am I going to be okay? So that still lives with you. You know what I mean? And even though I've been cleared of Corona, I still wear a mask around my family. Yeah. You got to, cause, yeah. cause things change all the time. So you're always like, it, it changes you in that you appreciate, I don't want to, I've always appreciated life, but now I can't wait to, I have a different mentality. I'm gonna say what I want to say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take more chances at things, not dangerous chances, but I'm a pretty just chill guy. But now it's like, right. nah, you know what? I'm, a, I'm not going to go skydiving or anything like that. But <laughs> it's a thing where I really want to get out there and live life. You know, yeah, really 
really, in it, it even applies to my comedy. You know, at yeah. times I always want to go up there and crush, but you got to work on new jokes, but sometimes you're scared to try out a new joke. I don't care anymore. You know, my, my idea is like, look, by what the doctor said, I could have had two days. I made it. So, I mean, what's, what's worse than that? That can happen to me. Right. You know, somebody right. not liking a joke I said, whatever. <laughs> so true. So you true. Know? I mean, you're, you're, you're an amazing guy. I mean, just, you've always been an amazing comedian and an amazing guy, but I just feel like I can see this glow around you. Like you're ready oh my God. to take it on now. Well, I think, I think also is you learn, like during that whole, the biggest thing I got is, you know, I've always loved my family, my kids, my wife, but you have a new appreciation of that. Cause when I was in quarantine, you know, it, this is going to sound crazy, but when I'm in quarantine, I saw my wife with the kids and cause I, you know, we got a camera in the house. Sure. She's an amazing mom and yeah. I'm so glad. And then you feel the appreciate. I'm so glad this happened to me. Because if it was the other way around, it would have been a lot worse. You know, our baby's yeah. breastfeeding. She won't eat anything else. Oh, yeah, so, it's that, sure. so it's that thing where, and also you get the, you get the realization that uh, if something went bad for you, it's going to be okay because you saw your wife with the two kids. I yeah. don't know. I know it's very dark, but that's very fulfilling too, that it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, so you yeah. don't have to worry. And that's the whole thing I came up with, just a new appreciation on life. Well, I've always appreciated it, but it's different now, you know? Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. So um, where can people find out more about you? I mean, this was a great conversation. I appreciate you staring, sharing the story. I know it's really soon. I mean, you just got out of the hospital like a week yeah. or so ago, right? Yeah. Oh, no, no, so no. I really no. It's, appreciate yeah, it's been, it's been, yeah, it's been almost, a, can you believe almost five weeks, four no weeks? No way. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. It goes wow. by so fast. It goes. Well, it took Especially me. It, quarantine. it took me a week and a half to get my voice back. Yeah. Oh. Once wow. I got back home. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's why you were texting me. Yeah. I, I was couldn't like, talk. I was like, why? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't I was talk. Like, why don't we just get on the phone? <laughs> I I couldn't talk. I I wow. I'm literally getting still in the process of getting my voice back. Yeah. You know, but. Yeah, not uh, yeah, it's way better than it was, though, I'll tell you that. So I, we're moving forward. I love it. I love it. What message do you have out there to people? I know you mentioned, like, take this seriously. What else do you want to tell people? I haven't been someone who's been through this and been through the worst part of it. I think, I think what people first need to realize, what they do, if it's not responsible, affects not just your family, but could affect other people's family. And people are dying alone dying alone. I mean, the nurses are trying their best and God love them. Um, I mean, they're putting people on face uh, on FaceTime, walkie talkies, phone calls. But when you're not surrounded by your family, it's just so sad. And that's, that's what we're living in. And I get it. I get it. Some people can listen to this and go, well, 80% of people not even affected. But I can tell you by looking at TV, over 41,000 people have been affected. Right. You know, those are those are 41,000 families and friends that have been affected. And for people to go out being not responsible by not wearing masks or taking the right precautions, it's just it's just so selfish. And when you have hundreds of thousands of frontline workers, cops, nurses, uh, people that work at the grocery store, uh, firefighters and more risking their lives for us. And then we're just basically saying, nah, you know what? We're gonna even threaten you more by not taking the right precautions. It's just so selfish. And just don't be that person. That's it. And most people aren't. But if you're listening to this, it can happen to anybody. And a, but a lot of people, it's like, unless it happens to them or somebody they know, they don't care. So I, I know I'm, um, I'm talking to a lot of deaf ears, but I'm saying, I never thought it would happen to me, but it did. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Michael. This was awesome. I know you're a busy guy, and I really yeah. appreciate you joining us. Where can people find you? Oh, at Michael Yo on Instagram. And I got a podcast, Michael Yo Show, on iTunes. I mean, anywhere you download podcasts, you can download it and uh, check it out. Awesome. Well, great seeing you, buddy. You so too. So glad to see you. I'm so glad you're still with us. 
You're, you, yeah, me too. Can't wait to see you in person one of these days. <laughs> All right, buddy. Have a great one. All right, buddy. Take care, man. Bye-bye.